Okay, I don't feel that music was buzzy enough. We needed more, right? This is a post-lunch <laughs> session. Um, hello again. I think Scott introduced us, but just in case, I'm Jennifer Hughes, the US Markets Editor of the Financial Times. We're here to talk about the future of financial services and crypto, and with me in order, I have got Greg Tussar, the Coinbase Head of Institutional Product, Cynthia Lowe Bessette, Head of Fidelity's Digital Asset Management, Roger Baston from Franklin Templeton's Head of Digital Assets, and Joseph Shalom Blackrock, Head of Strategic Partnerships. So guys, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate this. Um, and I should say at the top that we are taking questions for this session. There should be a um, QR code popping up on the screen shortly. And I think you use that and hashtag state of crypto. And the questions go to Coinbase who send them to me. So if you have any, please bring them up. Well, I like starting conference sessions like this by sort of setting the scene and just finding out what you are talking about with your clients and your colleagues right now. So, Greg, let's come to you first. Yeah. What are people saying to you? Yeah. First of all, thank you, and uh, very grateful everybody could join us today. Um, so by background, I, um, I've been at Coinbase three years. I look after the institutional product area. I spent the bulk of my career um, in the securities world building trading infrastructure, electronic trading tools, and so forth. And I, I left that world in 2017 to co-found a company, and the idea was to bring a lot of those learnings about how you would do um, electronic trading and prime brokerage and, the, and that sort of thing into the world of, of crypto. Um, and uh, so that became what we call Coinbase Prime. Um, and so a lot of our conversations with customers these days are about, particularly for those that are um, moving into the world of crypto from uh, you know, from the world of trading securities and, and derivatives and so on and so forth as to how to make this look like a similar experience in a lot of ways. And so, um, you know, that's meant making things like uh, prime financing and, um, you know, trading listed futures and so forth look and feel like trading equities and trading other things sort of side by side. So that's a lot of the conversation we're, we're having. Um, you know, we spoke earlier about different kinds of clients that are activating clearly, you know, in this environment. Um, I, I don't have a lot of conversations with customers where people are outright skeptical. Uh, but for, I'm, but, the, I'm the skeptic in the room. But, um, I told them their job is to convince me. So, you know, there are clearly customers, I think as both Brian and Brett alluded to, that are in various stages of activating. Um, I think the ones that are moving the fastest at this uh, at this stage, I would generally call fall into the systematic um, category, um, and I think the reason is it's you know th these are clients that have been engaged with us over the last 12, 24 months, and the reason is you know this is a an investing strategy that requires a big corpus of data, it requires building a lot of infrastructure, it requires building models and doing all of those things, and I think those kinds of clients have uh, have made a decision that this is a future investable asset class and therefore are willing to put in the work even through all of the cycles um, that we've been through over the course of the last year. And so that gives me a lot of confidence that, um, you know, that, that, that we are you know, moving forward. And then I think as uh, Brett mentioned earlier as well, on the corporate client side of things, initially there was a lot of interest in crypto as a balance sheet asset. I would say most of that has transitioned to crypto as a consumptive use case, a way to connect with clients, a way to have uh, utility. Um, and a lot of corporate clients um, have, have onboarded, onboarded to learn how to handle digital assets, um, how key management works, all of these sort of foundational things that seem like will be important parts of their sort of forward product strategy as well. So those are the, those are the things that are sort of most in the here and now for us. Okay. Cynthia, what about you? So uh, Fidelity has been building, and, well, researching um, and, and building uh, in the crypto space uh, since 2014. Uh, we have um, uh, launched um, commercial uh, offerings uh, to customers, both institutional and retail. 
And the division that uh, I'm responsible for um, is uh, continuing that uh, tradition of, of research and development and, and much of what Greg talked about um, in terms of building infrastructure um, as we are uh, looking at and exploring uh, ways to bring uh, investment exposures in the crypto space uh, to uh, our customers who continue uh, to be interested, uh, continue to engage, uh, and, and uh, we feel like uh, the fundamentals uh, and the um, power of the technology continues um, to provide promise for uh, infecting profound change uh, in our financial ecosystem. And uh, we are committed to continuing to, to do the research and, and um, look at building infrastructure to support that. Can I just ask, can I just follow up there and ask, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, big clients, uh, mm -hmm. institutional funds here. Have people been scared or shaken by what's happened in the last six, nine months, well, 12 months really yeah. now? Um, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, you know, the questions around the, the regulatory environment and, and price volatility uh, are part of the conversations. Um, but I think from the standpoint of uh, you know, where we are continuing to engage and, and see uh, interest from large investors, um, these are you know, people who um, have a similar mindset and, and continue to believe in, in the future um, uh, of this technology and, and look at it um, as a building block um, from an investment standpoint, um, a, a, a technology uh, play. Cool. Roger, what are you talking to people about? Yeah, you, you asked what are clients asking. Yeah. I think what the clients are asking us are what's going on, first of all. <laughs> Um, second of all is like, why is it important to us? Why should it be important to us? And then finally, like, how do we get involved? Um, all those type of, th those th things. And so as we walk them through that, the, you know, you know what's going on and, and why, Franklin Templeton's path down this um, um, to be in this place where we are, to be able to offer um, services around a number of different um, digital assets was all about how do we find, is there an application for blockchain in our core business, basically? And I think that's the journey that institutional adoption will go to. You have to find the reason why blockchain technology is used in your business. And once you uncover that, then you know it takes a small level two, level three thinking to be like, oh, this is, these are opportunity sets that will continue to grow um, you know, and, and move forward. And so, as we've come through there, um, finding a application in our core business where we could find efficiencies or increased utilities for behalf of customers and clients really set forward a path of you know, building investment teams that can offer advice on a growing array of digital assets moving forward. And then of course, as, as Greg and Cynthia has, has detailed, just the infrastructure environment within capital markets that blockchain would expect to play going forward has just been another really important part. If you're getting them from the why should we care to the how do I get involved, it sounds like you're doing a pretty good selling job right there. <laughs> so, um, Joseph, same sort of thing to you. What's top of your mind? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Coinbase is a really important partner of ours. I do need to start by saying uh, I can't comment on crypto given our S1 filing, but I think there are a lot of topics beyond Bitcoin and crypto and exposure vehicles that I can talk about. We're spending most of our time speaking to our clients uh, about three topics. One is just all things tokenization, not what it means in the short term, but what is the promise and potential in the long term and how does it affect their business. Second is, you know, we have a partnership with Circle. We're an investor in Circle. We manage their reserve. How can responsible, well-reserved, stable coins play a role, not just in the movement of money, but breaking down friction in institutional money movements? Not the retail space, not necessarily Web3. What are the pragmatic, practical applications uh, that there could be in this space? And third, a lot of questions about DeFi. What is DeFi? If, when the regulatory hurdles are, are overcome, how will that be something that affects their business? And there's lots of false narratives, DeFi versus CeFi, and I think we can get into that. But I think 
as important as the potential changes on their business, we're spending an equal amount of time understanding the short-term blockers. And each and every one of these has regulatory, technology, uh, maturity uh, blockers, and how can we play a role with our clients in finding ways to unblock uh, to the benefit of our clients. Where we're not spending a lot of time is in random POCs, because our strong belief is if it's not in production, if it's not in the client's hands, that's not innovation. That's experimentation. That's a good line. One thing I'd love to reflect on just is in terms of, you know, I mentioned having started in 2018, and uh, at that time when we started the company, institutional really meant venture. Uh, and, and even then, a lot of people that wanted to invest in the company as opposed to wanting to buy stealth store, et cetera. And I think if I went back and asked myself then, like, what would a moment feel like where you felt like this was a major milestone? Uh, I think it would be sitting here with this group, um, and that's just like four short years ago. So just reflecting on the amount of time it's taken to get from then to here, um, it does feel like we're having sort of a gradually then suddenly moment. Um, and I think that's the thing that when we talked about corporate clients and everybody else, what's on people's mind is I don't want to be behind in the gradually then suddenly moment. Um, and so it's really important to be investing uh, to make sure you're not behind the curve. Sorry, I keep making notes because I'm a journalist and I can't help it. Mm -hmm. But gradually then suddenly, that's a really good phrase. And I did want to ask about sort of the, the speed of adoption, the pace of it. Cynthia, coming to you, do you agree with... Greg's characterization. How far along this journey are we? Is this still like the early stages? Am I going to be doing this panel in 10, 15 years' time? <laughs> and we're still talking about the adoption then, or do you think it will be done? I, I, I very much appreciate your gradually, then suddenly. Um, I've myself used that, that phrase as well. And, and I think this is, um, you know, there are going to be waves of adoption. Um, it is still, and I think we've heard this a few times um, this morning, um, that the technology is still in early days. There are um, some really interesting use cases that, to Joseph's point, are in market. Um, but I think we need to see um, more um, consistency and, and stability from, from some of those um, use cases. Um, in, in terms of you know, how we've been thinking about uh, you know, where TradFi sits side by side with what we're seeing developing um, in DeFi, um, you know, I like to think of it as there is going to be um, an integration. I think this morning the word was used, merger, um, but it is an integration. Um, it, it's a capital market system. And you know, we think that from uh, the tokenization standpoint, um, that is a, a tool and a vehicle um, that will allow for traditional assets to be able to be traded um, uh, in a digital economy. And, and that's where you know, these are early days of, of being able to demonstrate uh, that these assets um, you know, will be able to take advantage of all of the things that we've you know, been talking about um, that blockchain and, and crypto provide in terms of instantaneous settlement, um, reduction of transaction costs, um, mitigation of, of need for capital uh, in order to collateralize long settlement cycles. So all the things that you know, we've seen um, in our capital markets over the last um, you know, several decades that there are um, improvements that come uh, to capital markets in the way that capital flows. Um, and, and we are in another um, stage of, of transition. Mm -hmm. Roger, what does the pace of change look like to you? Um, I'm of the mindset that the pace of change is exponential, quite frankly. Um, the question is whether, it's not whether what technology can do, but what technology should do. It comes down to those type of questions. So when we are um, conversing with the SEC about um, additional feature sets that um, allow our project Benji, which is our tokenized money fund um, in the US, uh, to proliferate. The questions that come back to us from the regulators is like, we see how the technology increases the velocity of everything. Um, and as we regulators are really worried about negative externalities, it's like, what happens? We don't, we're only a couple of months away from seeing what happens when um, more transparency um, and then concern, and quite frankly, fear starts permeating into a banking system and some well-established financial institutions end up going under or having to be rescued just in a matter of weeks, quite frankly. 
And so it's the technology is going to continue to move forward in an exponential rate. It's, it's the pace of how the regulators allow that adoption, quite frankly, in order to limit externalities. And I would also say, you know, one of the big frictions I think that exists in all this is because it's our view that these blockchain technologies are very disintermediating. And so when we think about the world, we ha there's those that have capital and those that need capital. And, you know, that middle ground, there's a lot of rent seekers inside of that middle ground. And the thing that excites us the most is that that disintermediation trend, which has been ongoing for a long period of time through a number of different technologies, and I think blockchain is just another iteration of those, is something that excites us because if we can continue to shrink um, the rent seekers in the middle, that allows better outcomes, i.e. better returns for clients in the long term, and that's what our single focus is. What can we give to clients? Do you want to give an example of who those rent seekers are at the moment? Uh, there are probably a whole bunch of us in this room, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just raise your hand jobs, if you're a rent everyone. seeker. <laughs> <laughs> rent seekers don't provide value. <laughs> they provide the operational capabilities. Yes. And so one of the exciting things that we see about this actually is, and I've, I've been at Franklin since 1991. Um, sharp elbows, super competitive business environment, you know, asset management. But what is super encouraging in the past, I would say even six months, is the number of collaborative conversations we are having just with mm -hmm. other asset managers, quite frankly, um, in a collaborative, cooperative way about how to be able to use these technologies to, um, to again, improve outcomes for clients. Well, if you all collaborate on this panel, that's all good <laughs> as well. Um, Joseph, what about you? How are you seeing the pace? I, I, I think speaking about tokenization, yes, there's a regulatory angle to this. But if you take a step back, the promises are digitally native, interoperable, crossing borders, instant settlement, lower cost, democratization. I think the blockers that we're focused on are within our own control not necessarily regulators. We need to coalesce on an asset class or two. Right now, everyone is trying to tokenize everything. And if you're trying to tokenize everything on every platform that don't interoperate, and you then don't have depth of liquidity, what is the promise? So I think there's an element of uh, the industry needs to coalesce around things. I think there's an element of we need institutional custodians to step in and play roles and participate in digital token economies. I think there is a regulatory aspect, but it's less the commodity versus security. It's borders. So we use these words interoperable across borders, but let's be honest. You wrap a fund. In traditional world, that fund is domiciled, registered, reported. The clients are in different jurisdictions. These things don't have passports that allow anyone to buy any fund and launch any fund. The fact that you turn it into a digital token doesn't remove the borders and barriers. Mm. So I think there is an element of we have to start with real production use cases that work within the right frameworks, the right borders, with the right participants. Um, so I think it's less necessarily about what the regulators are doing here as much as how we come together over years. I will share, I think the it's fair to say the last five years have not been kind to adoption of tokenized assets. It's, a I think, a fact. Our opinion is adoption over the next several years will be slower than people expect, but the adoption and impact in the long term is going to be monumental in shaping our ecosystem. Uh, I just think we overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term impact. What's, I mean, you say the need to coalesce around a few asset classes or a couple of real use cases there. What asset classes would you like to see that happen around? What do you think is most fertile ground for this could really prove the case for you? I, I think it's fair to say that very liquid money market funds is an obvious place. We tokenized a uh, US dollar Irish denominated money market fund with JP Morgan Onyx, what feels like two years ago. You're very focused on money market funds. The, but the question is like, what is the real value you're creating in something that's already liquid? There are use cases, including in the crypto native world who has to move back and forth and today wants to earn yield. You hold a stable coin, you don't earn, earn yield but you also need to be able to traverse those two environments. In the alternatives front, that obviously is where 
some of the greatest promises. But let's not forget, you know, the idea of fractionalizing something into something very small and democratizing it. You still have the issue that not everyone is qualified to buy an alts fund. You need to be an accredited investor. You need to be a qualified purchaser. And maybe smart contracts can figure that out. But there are other impediments to alternatives being adopted democratically um, that are not just the technology. Would it be easier to see, say, in the alternative space, say, an ETF of uh, private equity assets? Or I'm trying to think of like the alternatives where people say, we can create liquidity here. I'm really skeptical because of some of the things you mentioned. Would it be easy to see some other form of this becoming slightly democratized? I say an old traditional ETF to start with that proves it can be done before you're trying to do this through blockchain. Because otherwise you go, this is what blockchain and tokenization can do. And you're doing it on a new asset class at the same time. So you've got two sort of issues at the same time. I don't know the answer. It's interesting is that in some ways an ETF is already a technology wrapper and there's an underlying asset class. So I, I think it'll be a slow slog. I think we all need to be focused on what, how this is gonna change our ecosystem in the long term. We have very large, long-term thinking institutional clients, capital I. They're willing to wait it out, and they just wanna know when and how to participate. They're not speculators, they're not traders, they have long horizons. So, so one of the things that has been part of our experience in doing, in, um, make sure I right set the perception. Franklin Templeton offers Benji, but the, our, our foray into digital assets is fairly extensive beyond it. We have just found a use case to apply something that almost every individual and institutional investor holds, which is a money fund that yields, um, depending on what the Fed does. But part of our, you know, we're a publicly traded company. And you know our 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 project Benji started um, on the Stellar blockchain. That meant we, as an organization, held do hold Stellar Lumens. Now we don't have to hold a whole bunch of them. Shout out to the Stellar team who is here. I've, I saw Jason earlier today, by the way. But th this idea that we have to hold Lumens, and our CFO has to hold Lumens in a secure place, by and large, because it's a cost of input of recording on the Stellar blockchain. Now we're in that same place with um, Polygon and Matic, but this idea that CFOs aren't using cryptocurrencies in some sort of investment speculative place, but they're a cost of input of operating whatever services you do. That, when, the, when again, more use cases happen and there, that is just more common behavior that it doesn't become this like, I'm, a, I'm NVIDIA and I'm owning you know, Bitcoin because it supports basically, you know, me selling, you know, high-end, uh, you know, boards to uh, inside of the mining community. It is. I think that is when more adoption begins to happen. It, it demystifies this thing that you know everybody sees in headlines and actually, quite frankly, some volatile price movements. But just becomes it's just like human capital. All the other inputs that go into providing those services, it becomes more common. And again, that's part of our experience. But I, I fully anticipate all the across. Uh, the globe, commercial operators will be able to find their applications in these blockchains and they too, as just core business function, will own these digitally native tokens as a way to pay you know, the gas fees for recording um, blocks onto the, onto the chains. Yeah, I would just, back to Joseph's point and, and the, some of the things that were said, I, um, we are having quite a few conversations that really center, and it seems like the direction of travel is mostly towards money markets and short-term uh, short treasuries and so forth. Um, and I think that will help in a number of ways. One, there's a, a need for that um, as we think through the, you know, the post-banking crisis uh, desire maybe to hold uh, something other than, than cash. Um, but also as a, as a vehicle to having the market structure conversation that we're having about what is the, what is the right structure for digital assets, um, whether they be this kind of you know, true digital representation of a security, current representation of crypto, um, how do those things coalesce into some future state? Um, they're all very different, they're apples and oranges, but they're important um, vehicles for us to be having the conversation uh, with regulators. Cynthia, anything you wanted to add on that one? I, 
I agree with all the points, um, and you know, maybe this also you know, segues a bit into um, how is it that you know, we are thinking about what these um, you know, tokens might be, and not just purely from a, you know, we're going to buy and, and hold, and there's an investment aspect. I think a lot of what you just said is um, you know, bringing these um, uh, utilities more into the mainstream um, is you know, we're holding them because of um, you know, our need to be able to interact um, with the blockchains, which is how we, it is that we're going to access the services that are um, powered and, and made available. Um, and, and when we get to you know, that point of adoption, um, I, I feel like the conversations will be much more about um, the, the overall level of the financial service, the, the, the solutions that we're um, offering that are powered by the blockchain, and not just simply we're talking about crypto and, and digital assets. Now, I'm mindful that we've had panels talking about regulation, but it is a theme that we, everybody's talking about regulation. We can't avoid it. Um, <laughs> Greg, I mean, you used a phrase for the adoption of gradually and suddenly. It feels like that with regulation as well. <laughs> that we talked about it for a long time, and then the last year it's been kind of crazy. Um, what has that done in the institutional space? What, what, what do we need to see? What would be an ideal outcome? I think an ideal outcome Brian described in his, in his talk earlier. And I think fundamentally it comes back to the very simple question of what is a security and what is a commodity. Um, clarity on a framework for deciding that, I, I think, alone would go a long way towards giving people comfort and, um, and, uh, and enabling people to sort of engage in a more fulsome way for those that are sort of waiting and, and, on, and going a little bit more cautiously. Um, and I think that would, you know, that would give us uh, some clarity as to, you know, we have two broker dealers today. Uh, we know how to operate in that world, um, have navigated the world of, of exchanges and alternative trading systems and all of those things. We also have a, a regulated uh, uh, DCM and uh, hope soon to be an FCM, and so we know how to navigate in that world. I think what we need is just the clarity for which of those to pursue, um, and then we can move forward. And I think that's really the, that's the thing that we're most in search of in, in the moment. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, what would it look like for you? Our uh, conversations have centered around um, building a, a client-centric uh, regulatory model um, to allow for um, investors, um, developers, issuers, intermediaries, and, and other operators um, to have the clarity um, of uh, being able to interact um, with these assets and being able to provide services um, to investors. And, and that includes um, you know, classic uh, regulatory frameworks around um, disclosure uh, where appropriate uh, and um, you know, providing uh, transparency of, of operating um, uh, exchange uh, rules. Um, I, I don't have anything to add on regulation. Uh, we're, we're, we're optimistic. I don't know the time frame, but we're optimistic that the regulators and policymakers will come to the right answer that both protects investors at the same time, creates competition. Uh, I think in the meantime, you can control what you can control, which is maturing the ecosystem, working and partnering with good actors, uh, maturing the infrastructure. And then ultimately that becomes very, very um, self-reinforcing. If you have some clarity, you have good actors, you partner with people who ultimately have mature infrastructure, the money and adoption will come. Um, but we can only control what we can control. We're optimistic. It may take longer than people expect. We're in the long-term investing game and when it's ready, we will be there. I think optimism without a time frame is the mm. best way to look at regulation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you want it done in the next 12 months, then yeah, who knows where we'll be. Um, Roger, did you have anything to add? I don't think I have anything to add on the um, regulation, but um, shout out both to Fidelity and Coinbase because as it relates to their activities in custody. I mean, every conversation that we have across the planet has to do first with where's my assets custodied? Are they safe? by and large. And you know, that's the part of the infrastructure. I mean, I can assemble a, um, an A-list team of um, investment professionals, and um, I have done that, um, by the way. But the, but the idea that they deliver those products and services, foundational to every client is, where are the assets held? 
quite frankly. And, and you know, that's the place of trust, that, um, primarily that they're looking at. And I think that's something that we will see continue to evolve um, a number of different um, high quality, trusted uh, custodians delivering what they have done for decades in all of these other markets to bring into this space for their experience. And I think that's going to go a long way, quite frankly. Um, and I sometimes wonder whether um, our regulator friends actually have that, like, OK, let's get that act together and pushing forward, because it will help them in, in so many ways to answer questions as well. I'd, um, um, but that, that custody piece is a huge question and almost leads everything else when we're offering advice, it's like, what's that? What's, what's the solution right there? Now again, shout out to Coinbase and Fidelity because we're able to have really good partners in having that conversation and establishing that trust. Um, but it is definitely the place where institutional conversations start. Gotcha, I mean, custody and regulatory clarity more generally. You know, no big ask here or anything <laughs> like that. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Moving on, I mean, we've mentioned a bunch of things around, you know, we've talked about, well, um, Joseph, you brought up DeFi and tokenization. Mm -hmm. Let's go to DeFi first and talk a little bit about that and what that really does mean. Because if somebody comes up with a clear definition of what that means, <laughs> you get the prize for this panel. I swear I'm looking for one good definition. Ah. There's clearly an understanding and people believe that DeFi is just another way of replicating everything in central finance, but just with decentralized players. We actually think in the long run, um, you hear this oxymoron, institutional DeFi, but there will be a role for uh, smart contracts, for deep pools of liquidity, who uh, can basically create really creative pairs and allow transactions in a different way than, than can happen in the centralized space. That said, um, again, I'm an optimist, I'm not optimistic that we're going to solve the digital identity issue, which is a blocker for anyone to participate, the anti-money laundering issue, the KYC issue. People talk a lot about, oh, DeFi won't work because uh, it's automated market making and we need central order limit books. Like, that is just a fig leaf. We need clear understanding of who is in a pool. Uh, you may have seen our friends at Uniswap uh, launched version four. If you read carefully, there's almost an ability to create a permissioned pool, a permissioned contract with a group of people. That's a step forward, but uh, I think it's going to be very hard for large regulated institutions, no matter what liquidity is available, to participate without these blockers. What's interesting is I don't think it will eventually be a DeFi versus CeFi. To your point about custody, I'm not sure any institution who will trust a de decentralized pro protocol to be custodying their assets. There will be roles for people like Coinbase who have you know, institutional grade wallets to maybe be a bridge between DeFi and traditional uh, investors. I think that's many, many, many years away. Not that I'm a pessimist. I just live in a highly regulated, uh, a highly regulated space and so do our customers. But, I mean, you're coming back to sort of basic trust issues there. Mm -hmm. The idea that somebody, as you say, wants to know where their assets are all the time, who's got it, where it is, how safe is it? And so the idea, I'm just trying to paraphrase what you're saying here, the idea is that people have got to trust that it's, it's there, it's kind of there, even if you don't know, if you can't point to I, I think who has the, it. That is the second issue. The first issue is who am I trading with? And if I don't know who I'm trading with, you don't get to the custody question. How do we get to that point of being confident being comfortable with who we trade with, um, of the identifiers. Is there a way through you can uh, see to get there? There are probably smarter people on the panel. All I know is we go to jail if we don't know <laughs> who we're trading with. And so there this have- This the pessimistic to, part of your yeah. view, right? No, it, it's the realistic, uh, I can participate in ecosystems that are regulated and well understood. I can't participate on a whim in an ecosystem where you don't know who, who's in that pool. Yeah. So I completely agree with Joseph that solving this problem is a hard blocker to, um, to having um, capital I institutional participation in crypto. Um, if the theme of the day is optimism, I'm slightly more optimistic than years. Uh, we're spending a lot of time thinking about how identity would work. Um, we are spending a lot of time in building institutional grade 
uh, wallet services mm -hmm. that are connected to the qualified custodian that would allow you to easily and freely move back and forth between the, uh, the, the custodial world and the self-custodial world, which is necessary to engage in, uh, in DeFi smart contract signing transactions, those sorts of things. Um, but I, I think the identity problem, while there's not a, a solution to it today, is a solvable, is a solvable problem. Um, and I do think that, you know, that, I think it will fall into the gradually then suddenly thing. And it, the reason I th say that is the, the journey we saw a lot of customers go through, I think back to um, 2020, we saw our first hedge fund clients engaging us. And the first thing they wanted to do, the same thing I wanted to do, when I, I, we just want to buy Bitcoin. Okay, that's fine. So we did that. And then a day later, it was like, what about these other assets? And by week three or four, asking questions about yield farming and how do I do all of these things? And so that, that transition happens for people in a very- That's pretty quick though. Pretty, pretty well, fast. Well, at least the hedge funds, right? So. And, but I think in order to move that into a highly regulated framework um, is a different matter. But I'm just saying there, the, the appetite and desire is there to, to have that happen. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, you're nodding. Yeah, um, I, everything that um, just uh, said uh, you know, resonates. Um, we think it is definitely early days uh, for um, how uh, applications and services across an open financial platform um, will continue to evolve. I, I think those um, issues from a uh, institutional or a regulated um, environment or a regulated entity to participate, um, you know, the AML KYC um, issues in, in identity are incredibly important. Custody clearly um, incredibly important. Um, and there, there are you know, many people, including you know, people within Fidelity that have been doing you know, research and, and thinking about um, these, these issues as well. Um, but until we are able to, you know, to solve for them, um, you know, I, I think we are um, uh, a bit, there, there's a gap um, between where we are today and, and uh, broader adoption. Mm -hmm. um, Roger, your thoughts, DeFi? I, I have no, um, I have no pessimism about the identity issue, um, quite frankly. Um, maybe that's just because I have confidence in having operated in these regulated environments that we're, we're entirely comfortable that there is a, a, um, a great customer base out there that is you know, not even anywhere in the path of their journey and all of this that um, will be great partners moving forward. Um, I, and I, I just don't have any, any problem with that. I think you know, if there's an identity issue that we all identify as, as you, you know, knowing are, are you a person, an entity, or are you a machine? Um, that's the one with this AI trend that we got coming forward that you know, I'm asked about that on every app all the time, punched if you see a bicycle in the square to know that you're actually a, a, a person and not a machine. Um, that might be more important thing about identity moving forward, but I don't have any problem um, with the identity side. Again, I think it's really um, this idea that um, this network economy, if there, is, if, if there is an institutional quality investor in a pool, I mean, there's all sorts of constructs in TradFi markets where that kind of exists already. That's not a real hurdle, I think, for even um, investors to put money to work in that construct. One of the words that we use constantly when we're building inside of this space is trustware. We understand that we're in a brand of trust that institutions or individuals or, or their advisors are only going to hand us. Um, money, wire us money, send us money if they trust us. Mm -hmm. Everything that we build has to be in a trustware environment. And, and the beauty, I think, behind some of the blockchain environments is that you have the same record here as you have there, quite frankly. And so you eliminate, again, some of that intermediary friction that says, well, this database is slightly different than this one, and there's a reconciliation that has to happen between them. There is so much friction in the capital markets about reconciling records that um, that's just a, a really tremendous efficiency gain by itself in using these, these uh, chains for that activity. I mean, gradually, then suddenly, I realized we started this panel gradually and suddenly we're getting towards the end here already. Um, question from the audience, and I was coming on to tokenization next, but someone has asked, as tokenization grows and if crypto is meant to disrupt intermediaries, 
how do you see the relationship between banks and asset managers change? Which comes back to our point about rent seeking, I guess, from earlier. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit more. And, um, you know, Roger, I'll come to you because that was your point. <laughs> okay. Well, talk a little bit more about that. I have enough experience to know that it's never this or that. It's always this and that. And so we're going to have a mosaic. Um, there's just going to be some people. My mother is never going to want the Benji token in her portfolio because she just that's not in her you know ideas of what what things how things work um, in the world. And so she's not going to be an adopter. Yet her you know her grandchildren are you know proud holders of, of, of that product. And so it, that, that mosaic is going to exist. I, we're not going to get rid of banks. We're not going to be getting, I mean, you know, all of the activity we've been doing since the global financial crisis is actually to strengthen that utility, right? That utility. And I think that's another thing that, um, that if there's a political movement forward about blockchain, it's the identifying that these are utilities for the digital economy moving forward. You want the lights on all the time. You want the nodes working. You want seamless activity so that whatever you build on top of that moving forward, if we think about it as a utility and all the different applications, even in, in public and civilian life uh, that can come to, to, to bear, it's, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. It's away from crypto, this opaque thing about what are the use cases that actually impact me in my daily life as I'm trying to you know, walk across Mother Earth and um, you know, toward a better outcome. Um, we've got about four minutes left, so I'm going to come to one last question. This would have been a good one to start with, but I think it's a nice one to end <laughs> with. Um, can you each briefly, emphasis on briefly here from me, describe how your organizations entered the crypto space? What was the entry point and what built the business case? Can you talk about how you or your own personal journey into this space? I'm just curious as to how you all got here. So I describe, I'll, I'll be very brief. I described mine, uh, which started in 2017 in starting a company that, uh, that was building institutional grade infrastructure. Um, something about it all felt inevitable to me. Um, and I still feel that way. And um, I feel very fortunate, I, having spent a long time in the world of electronic trading, starting on the floor of the exchange and asked the specialist one day, like, is this ever gonna change? He said, nope, never. Um, and then two or three years later, um, it was completely changed and different. I feel like I have the good fortune of being on that curve yet again and um, living, you know, the, living a lot of the same experiences of being on the exponential curve. And uh, I feel like it's, it's very fortunate. So. Uh, Person. That's since 2014. Uh, so, well, and, and that's the fidelity journey. My own personal journey uh, began uh, at the end of 2019 uh, in um, coming to fidelity and, and uh, getting involved in building investment products uh, uh, around crypto, um, which very quickly became, um, let me better understand uh, you know, what blockchain technology uh, and the promise that it brings um, could uh, be for uh, the financial um, ecosystem. And, and that really, um, you know, we talk about disintermediation. Um, decentralization and disintermediation are, are you know, uh, sort of part and parcel. Um, but, you know, the way we think about it is uh, we are intermediaries. We are focused on our customers. And, and I think a little bit of what Roger says, we're going to adjust um, you know, our uh, service levels um, uh, to be able to engage uh, with our customers in, in ways that they find uh, value in and in most um, useful. And I think that will continue to be the case uh, where um, there will be a role for intermediaries. It may not look the same the way it does today. Yeah. Roger. So my personal journey has been um, started with, well, first of all, I pay attention to words. Words really matter. Um, distributed ledger technologies, ledger. The word ledger really resonated with me because we just have so many records in our business. And it's like, if there's not something to do here, um, then, you know, we're wholly mistaken. Um, but that just set forth a path of, let's just, you know, I agree with your experimentation versus proof of concept, but no success is built without a whole series of failures. So it had to start somewhere of just understanding what that might do uh, by and large. So that was my own. Also, just I've just been somebody who has, has just had the mantra of higher people partner and work with people who are much smarter than me, by and large. Um, and that frees me up to be able to have mind space about expanding opportunity sets for clients in order to help them have better outcomes. I mean, BlackRock has been on a journey. 
we, over the past two or three years, have had literally hundreds of conversations with customers, ecosystem players, crypto native, TradFi. We listened, we tried to hear where there was interest. Uh, we had to socialize it. It took a while for people to understand what these things are and what they're not. But we've been cautious, we've been opportunistic, and we work with partners. And we're sitting on this table because we spend a lot of time searching for the right partners in the space and do a lot of diligence because we're a fiduciary. Um, and then we plant flags on things that we think are going to be strategic to create option value. But we have a great team. It's 12 people. It's not 1,200 people. So we, it forces prioritization, and the priority is what the clients are asking for. Well, that's probably a good point to wrap up on. This I we finish with you, the optimist, the self-declared optimist. Yeah. Well, I guess I think we'd all you'd all say that you're in that space too. So um, before I hand over to the next group, I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening and thank you for the questions. But most of all, thank you to the panel. You've been great. Thank you.